So, welcome everyone. This is probably the most um, interesting in certain ways, not that other panels are not interesting, but interesting from the perspective that people keep on asking the same question, where are the exits? Mm -hmm. So today we have gotten together founders who have done exits. Some of them have done one, some of them have done multiple exits. Um, so a quick round of introduction. Maz, co-founder, uh, Stars Play, uh, operating across Middle East, North Africa, Pakistan. Mudassar, co-founder Kareem. Kareem needs no, um, I would say, introduction, operating across Middle East, uh, North Africa, Pakistan. Um, Heather, EMPG, Zameen, Bayut, Dubizil, and many more, operating across Middle East, North Africa, Pakistan, Thailand, Akib, Cloudways, uh, serving the global market, out of Pakistan, um, Asan, Daraz, uh, started out in Pakistan, became a South Asian portal uh, across multiple markets. Uh, Michael Koy, uh, Zootpay, operating across Central Asia, Pakistan, Middle East. And uh, they acquired company recently, Tez Financials, operating across Pakistan with Noreen. So when I look at this panel, the first question that comes to my mind is, where did I go wrong in life? <laughs> and perhaps there are many reasons for that. Um, but when I look at this panel, a couple of things became become apparent for me. While these founders come from different industries, different sectors, subsectors, and they started at different times over the last decade or more, there's some things which are common, certain things which are common. Almost all of them, raise their capital, first capital, at a time when venture capital was not fashionable, neither in the region nor in Pakistan. So they had to go out really wide and get the first bit of capital overseas from another geography most of the time. Almost all of these founders took, on average, about eight years to do a major merger or exit. So not a short story, it takes time to do an exit. I believe the journey we have here is between four to 14 years, more or less, between these founders. Um, almost all of them, without exception, became regional or international players before they had the major exit or, or merger. And lastly, or in fact, last but not least, almost all of them, irrespective of whether Pakistan was a small market or a big market within their portfolio, developed their tech stack almost entirely in Pakistan. Um, and post-merger or acquisition, almost all of them have chosen to stick around. So these are some broad major themes which we want to sort of you know, bounce off and start with. And the first thing which comes to my mind is that given your journey on average has been eight years across founders, and you started at a time when capital raising for venture space was very, very difficult in this region as well as in Pakistan. Give us a sense of your first capital raise, anecdotes around your first capital raise. Maybe you can start, Maz, on your side. Sure. Um, so, so in our case, uh, we, we got started with uh, friends and family investment in, in UAE. Um, and then um, we, we were fortunate enough to find uh, some early seed investors in Europe. Um, and then our first institutional uh, round was um, through American investors. Uh, one was a strategic investor uh, f uh, from Hollywood, Lionsgate, which is a studio in the U.S. And then um, uh, the other institutional investor was, um, was GE Pension Trust, uh, GE Asset Management from Stamford, uh, Connecticut. So, so for us, it was a combination of uh, strategic uh, investors from the industry as well as uh, uh, financial. Our model is perhaps slightly different uh, from other uh, tech companies in the sense that um, we're in the content business, so it's, it's, uh, it's uh, high fixed cost and uh, significant capital to get started. Um, so therefore, we needed um, venture capital wasn't the ideal um, source of funds for us. So we needed a, a strategic investor to, to validate our business case, validate our vision, and that's where Lionsgate came in. Uh, but they were also very upfront in the beginning saying, look, uh, we're, we're happy to be part of the venture, but you need to go find a financial uh, investor to, to join the venture. 
And that's where uh, we were very fortunate. Uh, we found uh, GE Pension Trust to come into the venture. So that was our Series A. And then over time, um, other institutional investors came on. But that's how we got started. Uh, and that was back in 2013. So it's been nine years for us now. Yeah. Let's see if this works. Yeah, so uh, yeah, 2011-12 was, was a tough time to raise money. Uh, and similar to Ma's, uh, the first round was an angel round. So everyone gave a $50,000 check, became half a million dollars. And against, uh, let me take this, against uh, all my advice, my mother-in-law decided to invest as well. And I said, <laughs> this cannot go well. And as soon as there was an opportunity to do a secondary, I exited her. And she still curses me to this day. But it felt like a calculated risk to get some angel money in. And then the Middle East is a very interesting place, or was an interesting place 10 years ago. There's, of course, a lot of money. A lot of people have a lot of money but they didn't really understand the risks associated with investing in these type of businesses. So the kind of discussions that we would have with people who had money was, uh, when are you going to become profitable? What kind of dividends can I expect once you become profitable? And it was very, very clear that this thing, if it doesn't go well, will become a big problem for us even to remain in this country. And outside of those investors, there were just a handful of VCs uh, that we could go to. And one by one, all of them rejected us. So. Uh, somehow one of them had a second thought and called me once and said, yeah, let's take a look at this again. And we were stuck upon a valuation, which in hindsight was such a foolish thing to do. Um, and they said, okay, fine, we'll give you this valuation if you hit these numbers by the end of the year. And we're like, okay, fine, it seems like an interesting challenge, let's do this deal. And we didn't hit the numbers, they got the valuation they wanted, but the deal got done. But the most interesting thing was the second round that happened, and it's just, you know, it's, at some point, it was a numbers game, right? The more people you talk to, you don't know who where the next money will come from. So randomly, I get an email from a person uh, from the alumni uh, list of the college that I went to and said, I'm going to be in Saudi. I want to do something for the summer. Can I come and work for you guys? And I'm like, yeah, you're at Stanford. You're a good guy. Why don't you just come? We'll work with uh, you over the summer. And after he left, uh, uh, be just before he left for the back to college, he said, by the way, my brother uh, is becoming the CEO of this travel company in Saudi. Maybe you guys should meet him. You know, okay, interesting. We should, of course, meet anyone that has money, wants to give us money. And that actually then became the, the second round. And just like the first round, there was only one offer on the table. And fortunately, that offer materialized. And until the fourth round, literally, there was only one term sheet on the table consistently. And we were like shitting in our pants. What's going to happen if this thing falls through? But Alhamdulillah, I think it worked out uh, almost always. Thank you. Can you just carry on? Okay. Um, so I'll just, uh, I'll do a quick intro. Um, so we're actually, um, so we're three brothers. Uh, and uh, the other two brothers, Azishan and Imran, some of you might have uh, met them. They're the ones who founded the business back in, I think, 2008. Uh, Zameen in Pakistan. Um, and then I was in the US, so I joined them around 2014. So our first round happened before I came uh, over here, um, and I actually moved to the UAE, um, and I'll talk a little bit about that. But it was interesting. I remember, you know, I was, you know, we used to have plenty of discussions, and the first round was the idea was we needed money, and and we were not too hung up. Uh, I mean, you know, both I talked to the chairman, they're not too hung up on valuation, but the idea was to create. A uh, smaller bucket, um, I would say about tickets of like 200k, 250k, uh, and we used to go to these, uh, you know, they used to, uh, traveling a lot to these conferences, and, and said, okay, well, we'll try to find some people who have done something in the portal space before the kind of the real estate portal space, um, and uh, so so the idea was just raise a million, uh, and then then you know you go from there, uh, and so we were you know we were able to get the the million uh, back in 2011, 12. Uh, mostly from people um, uh, who had been part of this industry before in other parts of the world. Um, and then the second raise, which was, uh, you know, uh, I've lost count, uh, frankly, like A, B, it doesn't really matter. But the second raise um, was, was particularly interesting because we knocked a lot of doors uh, across the planet, uh, US, UK, uh, even Turkey. Um, and we, we got two offers. Uh, one was out of uh, Turkey and the other one was out of the uh, UK. Uh, and, and you know, this, this fund uh, that was looking to invest in Pakistan had invested in the public space in Pakistan um, 
Kingsway. And and so I said, okay, you know, um, take the money um, and, and, and we go from there. And then from there onwards, um, I think the, 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 the heart, probably the, you know, I would say they, they in themselves, you know, again, similar story where it said, okay, um, you know, there are some certain numbers, you know, um, let's try to hit those. Uh, but the second and th the, the third round after the second round happened pretty quickly from the same guys. They said we want to deploy even more. Um, so that was uh, interesting uh, because, you know, we didn't expect that money to come. And it literally came three months after the, the second round. Um, and then, you know, from there onwards, uh, I th you know, we uh, basically got more investors on board. But what was really interesting was that as we, these funds, once they're invested, you know, they, they actually introduce you to their LPs. Um, so we met with a lot of their LPs. And typically what we noticed was a lot of family offices uh, were, were more open to investing in this part of the world as a, uh, opposed to the kind of the bigger funds. And we met all the big funds, uh, you know, you go to... Uh, you go to California or New York, like, you know, a couple of streets, a couple of blocks, you can cover pretty much everybody. Um, but a lot of the family offices uh, invested money. Um, and, and, and then from there, um, you know, we've, uh, we've done a few more rounds. Um, and that's, that's where the kind of the bigger investors came on board. Uh, we just did our last round uh, last year, we raised 200. Um, I can go on and on, but uh, happy to have a chat with anybody who, uh, you know, who wants to uh, have a word about how to go about those things. Uh, but frankly, just one thing, which is a lot of the money, um, last year was very interesting, it was a very difficult year, uh, fundraising, uh, but it really comes down to numbers uh, at the end of the day. You know, what is the business doing? Um, I'll, I'll share one last thing with you. I remember it was 2021, and we were profitable in the UAE. And somebody made a comment to me that uh, positive is the new negative. Why are you guys <laughs> positive? And I know I came back to the office and uh, I was talking to Zishan Ran. I was like, what are we doing wrong? Because, you know, we're actually making money. Uh, well, you know, three months later, the world kind of flipped. Uh, and uh, last year, we raised money because we were positive. So uh, these things, the landscape changes pretty quickly. Um, and you just got to focus on the business and, and keep growing it. Thank you. Uh, Akib, you have a unique story because you never raised any capital from outside, all yeah, bootstrapped. I, I am the odd one out here, uh, completely bootstrapped. So $60,000 initially in seed investments, and then always focused on long-term mission, kind of like mission critical, mi mission oriented, capital efficient business, strong focus on culture, strong unit economics. And a lot of that, what we do in the initial days was like product-led growth and the, having the capital structure in Pakistan, having a whole team in Pakistan, kind of like facilitated this. So our revenue structure was outside country, so we were selling globally to, 40% was North America, but the cost structure was all in Pakistan. So I think uh, bootstrap is kind of like a mindset, and our mindset was generally around building the value, then valuation, and that kind of like really helped us. So we exited with $350 million, 100% ownership, the founders and employees, not a bad thing. Uh, hi, uh, so my name is Asin Sayab. I'm here from Daraz. So I think um, Daraz's story is, it varies, of course, from, from the founders here in that it was not traditionally founded by, you know, uh, well, not by me, but also by just certain individuals who founded the idea. Many of you may have heard of Rocket Internet, um, you know, and, and their business model. And, and Pakistan was another sort of uh, test case for their business model of successful businesses that have worked in other places. And they built a very rapid team, uh, very strong team. And they, you know, they really funded the business for the, for the first uh, few, few years. And then actually the, the second raise was from the, from the Qataris. And that sort of held out more or less in, uh, you know, despite quite close calls for many, for many years. That generally held out until, until the Alibaba transaction, which happened in, in 2018, which also made it a little bit easier uh, because you didn't have, you know, such a, you didn't have a, such a complicated cap structure. But there was a lot of, uh, and I'm sure we'll talk about it a little bit in detail as well, there was the complexities of, of getting all that cleaned up before, before a transaction happened. So it's a little bit different of a case um, in that it was, you know, the funding came with the, with the idea. Um, a lot of the product was also already, you know, already built, and it was really just scaling the business very quickly in Pakistan, uh, seeing how the numbers flow out. And this eventually led them to being able to consolidate a few plays in Pakistan. So KMU was acquired in 2016, 
which actually is what built uh, the Dharazas today, um, which is across uh, you know five countries: Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Nepal, and Myanmar. And the first and the two biggest markets being Pakistan and Bangladesh. Thank you. So Michael and, and uh, Noreen, in a way, uh, is an interesting theme which we're going to explore a bit more tomorrow in our um, in a pan-regional place. But um, Michael, obviously, already operating uh, your platform out of Central Asia, Middle East, and Noreen uh, starting her, her fintech in Pakistan and eventually getting acquired. And now you're one company, but you know, maybe if you can quickly provide you know, a bit of your story. Yeah, on, on my side, yeah. I mean, um, yeah, we have a, we name ourselves like a digital lending platform for the emerging market. We are specialized uh, to give a debt uh, for the unbank or underbank people in the frontier. And to be able to give a loan for this kind of population, we need the data. And for that, we are building an ecosystem uh, to be able to build the data and be able to lend to this population. That's why uh, we have built an uh, ecosystem that is a marketplace. Uh, is a lending and the e-logistic. We are building data for marketplace. Uh, we have a BNPL system to build the credit story on the behind of the customer side. And when we know the customer, we make a consumer lending. And to be sure that we can manage the fraud, we are managing end-to-end -end the logistics side. And that's the way that we do that. Uh, we started with uh, Uzbekistan. That's the first market that we start. When uh, the market was uh, stable, we moved uh, to the Middle East, the Iraq and Jordan and Lebanon. And now we are entering the Pakistan market. Going back uh, on the fundraising side means uh, we, are, we were lucky because we are the same team on previous uh, venture that we, uh, we, we set and we exceed on this venture and with this money we start uh, this venture. Like, I mean, that, that was easier for us um, and, and it was, otherwise it was very difficult because we are a Swiss company and uh, when we are talking about the market that we are right now, for them most of the time they don't know which geography we are talking about. <laughs> and investment as a mandate most of the time they don't have it. And uh, the way this happened, we financed the seed by ourselves. Uh, when the beta version, the proof of the concept was done, uh, we had a discussion with a strategic partner because uh, we believe that these guys will understand better uh, the interest that you can bring from them. And first one was Zain Telco Company in, uh, in Kuwait. And that's the first uh, company who invests in us massively. And after that, when the Zayn came, uh, we had the help of the deployment in the Middle East. And uh, with them, the other investor joined us to the next round. Up to now, we have fundraised for $50 million. And uh, we are closing another $60 million for the next three months. Thank you. That's where we are. So, Noreen, uh, I know, uh, now I, I, you, you've merged with Zootpay, and but, but I think your story also sort of started early in a time and space where raising capital was quite challenging. So how was your initial capital raise done? Well, with these, um, you know, Honestly, when I started, um, we didn't even really understand what deal terms meant. You know, this is back in 2017, 18. Uh, VC wasn't really a term that was heard in Pakistan back then. And there were hardly any local VCs at the time. Um, you know, other than eye to eye, maybe, um, you know, there, there weren't any that we had in Pakistan. And what most of the startups were doing was either going out of Pakistan or they were trying to, you know, raise funding through challenges. I remember Karandas, you know, was giving out grants at the time through Bill and Belinda. So a lot of the startups, including ourselves, you know, we were, we were eyeing those grants. Um, so when we actually, we raised funding in 2018, and, you know, we were very fortunate because one of my co-founders at the time, Nadeem Hussain, he already had a story in the financial services space, and it was a success story with an exit, you know. So Tamir Bank and Easy Pesa had already banked an exit at the time. Um, and we were able to raise funding from Umidyar Network, which is now Flourish Ventures, and Axion. Umidyar had, Im had an impact focus, and Axion was a microfinance funder, still is. Um, and when we raised funding, you know, it was really just an idea on a paper. But interestingly, we'd already pivoted the idea through you know, our conversations with multiple investors at the time. Um, and you know, this is the time when, you know, Companies were raising, you know, at the likes of a hundred, two hundred thousand dollars. You know, those were sums that were actually flaunted at the time in Pakistan. Um, and yeah, we, we, when we raised funding, it, we were actually the first licensed fintech, which was into lending. So I think that really built the case. And there wasn't any precedent in digital lending at the time. So with the Midian and Axion, you know, they already were in several markets at the time. What helped was, you know, their expertise. And of course, their relationship with us prior to that, which helped us in that round. Um, and yeah, 
I think the acquisition story is another story altogether. Uh, we can talk about that later. Great. Um, so I think the other major theme, as we see here, is the is the is the regional platform development. And the question really is for you guys: when you were starting out, uh, you know, consciously, was that a conscious decision that you have to make a regional platform? Did it sort of was a byproduct of what you ended up doing? And as in terms of firefighting, like, what was the thought process like, uh, when you when you started off? Uh, up to you guys. You can take in whatever order you think is works. I, I can answer. Yeah. So I was uh, born in Karachi, raised in Karachi, so was here, understood the market pretty well. And uh, uh, I think uh, understanding the market was a key thing for us. And of course, we were big on Pakistan, so uh, economic impact here was another thing. And I think uh, we've worked with quite a few uh, countries when it comes to talent and the kind of hunger, ambition that we were seeing in the talent here was amazing. And also, there were not many companies who were doing product-related stuff in Pakistan. So we were the only B2B global play. And that kind of like gave us a lot of differentiation. And it helped with uh, building the culture, retention, uh, finding good people, etc. Having said that, there were like a lot of challenges in, in a sense that, I mean, that, that talent was, uh, the talent that we needed and the talent uh, that was there in the market, there was a big difference, right? So we were very methodical about our approach where we, tip, I mean, very meticulously had an organization Sorry, within uh, an organization. Just a second. Sorry, excuse me, if you can uh, lower down the volume um, and if, if you want to discuss something, if you can go to the other room. Um, excuse me. Um, if you can lower down the volume, um, if you guys have a conversation, I think maybe you can go to the other room. Thank you. No, I, I appreciate it. So definitely, I mean, understanding the market, uh, having that differentiation that there are not many global providers here in Pakistan. So there were not many product companies at all. So we had that differentiation. And thirdly, of course, the, the, the cost was uh, incredibly, uh, kind of like it was an incredible unfair advantage for us. That was a big thing. But as I said, I mean, there were, it was challenging because the, the, mar the market wasn't ready to compete in the global uh, workspace sort of environment. So what we did really, if you, if you come to our office or campus, you will see that it's really an organization within an organization that looks like a university where we train our people with a pretty methodical and systematic manner at scale to kind of like prepare them for, for, for this global uh, kind of like competition. So having that institutionalized sort of system, which we kind of like became our secret sauce and we were able to scale that across the different functions was like a key for us. So uh, knowing the market, cost, and that the, the institutionalized scaling that we did through systematic way was a more was a core reason for us. Thank you. So Maaz um, uh, how, Mundasar, how, how did the regional play come into being? Sorry, how did the, how did the regional play develop it was it a conscious conscious well, decision so early on how does it, did it yeah how was it i mean process? look i think uh you know you go back i guess go back going back to the funding thing um you know the the the, the term that we use internally was we need to diversify our zip code um you know pakistan while has a large population um all of that is fine um but people generally these are fairly exotic markets uh you know when you go to the u.s and, and you're trying to raise funds uh, so, um, and, and you kind of have to, you know, they're not used to investing and it's a smaller portion of their portfolio that actually goes into these markets. So, so regionality was important uh, because, uh, um, you know, you're, you're going after a bigger user base. Um, also, what we figured out over the years was that the emerging markets, they're all very different. Uh, although, you know, you're, okay, you fly from Pakistan, you know, we're in Bangladesh, Thailand, everywhere. They're all different, right? But one thing that's common is, is that, Tech came in uh, pretty quickly, while maybe the systems hadn't evolved over uh, over the years. So it gives you tremendous opportunity to kind of drive the direction you want to take. Um, you know, like let's say real estate. Like how is that going to evolve? Uh, and um, and you can have a lot of influence, but that requires patience, time, and money. Um, and uh, you know, some some people have money but don't have time. Um, but anyway, so, so you kind of have to, one, you got to have a large enough base. And so regionality was just important because we had to go after a bigger market space. And honestly, the, the, the most important thing is, well, the reality is that everything gets measured in dollars, okay? 
So one of the one of the biggest headwinds that we face is you know you grow 80 percent, 100 percent currency devalues by 100 uh, percent, you don't grow uh, in dollar terms. And since you raise money in dollars, people expect return in dollars as well. Um, so that's that's a challenge. So it, it also acts as a bit of a hedge, right? Uh, you know, GCC is very fortunate in that in the sense that it's pegged to the dollar. Um, so that's that's great. Uh, but then other countries have large populations, which you know are kind of your longer term journey, right? So, uh, so yeah. So uh, it was it started from diversifying zip codes to one market to another to another to too many, uh, and then realizing that too many is too many, and you know we need to focus on a few winners. Um, so yeah, we've gone through this kind of whole learning uh, learning process, and I guess just part of that, uh, all of our tech it originally came from Pakistan. Um, and then um, when, when I was in the US, I used to manage a team in Romania. And so I called up a few people that I used to work with and I said, you know, look, you know, we need, we have the team in Pakistan, but we also need to kind of uh, invest in the future of the, of the platform. So we actually started up a, uh, a tech team in Romania. Uh, so it was interesting because we were working in Pakistan, we were actually outsourcing some of the tech. Um, but that allowed us to build a platform that we could actually take regionally. Um, and it allowed us time to actually build the talent, like, I think my colleague over here pointed out, like there's not a whole lot of sense around product development, right? There's a lot of service industry. So, so that took a bit of uh, time to get sorted. Yeah, yeah look, I think uh, just to sort of take a step back from this, right? I think for the audience, it depends on what business you are building, right? Whether you want to stay in one country or you want to be regional. So when we start Kareem, it was supposed to move consultants around, right? We were a B2B business when we started. And if you're moving consultants around, you cannot just be in one country. These consultants will go to Saudi, they'll go to Egypt, they'll go to Pakistan. They have to be served in those markets as well. That was part of the value proposition. So it was very natural for us to say, okay, we need to be in Saudi because a lot of these people go to Saudi and we need to be serving them in Saudi and that's part of the value proposition. But now when we are doing some other businesses, especially there are probably a lot of FinTech entrepreneurs in the room, it's much harder. To, uh, to scale because there is regulation, there's compliance, there's on soiling. So, you know, some of those businesses are more, more local or have to be more local at least, you know, at a time to some extent. So uh, I think the answer depends uh, on the business that you're building. Um, and what may have also been the right answer in the last 15 years, is probably not the right answer today. <laughs> in the last 15 years, you could have 10 countries that you could all be losing money in simultaneously and that was fine because it was very easy to raise money. But today, you know, you have to go back to the basics, right? You know, first the few countries that you're in have to make money. And then the money that you make from those first few countries have to pay for the expansion to for the new other countries, right? That's how businesses were always built. Someone reminded me the other day that Starbucks did not go to India until 2012. Right? If some if a company like Starbucks can wait until 2012 to go to a big market like India when there was so much activity in that market and coffee chains were popping up right and left and gaining market share, then I'm sure many of us can be humble and say, it's okay, Rome wasn't uh, conquered in a day and we can probably wait a bit as well. And Starbucks has entered certain markets and exited certain markets after that as well. Be being Starbucks, knowing that coffee is a drug, mm -hmm. so. <laughs> Um, so, so for us, like like Nasser was saying, you know, it's uh, it depends on the industry. You know, we're in the we're in the entertainment business, so we're entertainment first, tech later, perhaps. And so, so in 2013, when we were getting started, the landscape in this part of the world was you had public broadcasters uh, that were basically um, serving um, uh, the region with Arabic content for free. And then you had the likes of OSN, uh, which were priced at $100 a month. And so, so the opportunity we saw was to build a product that serves the audience in between, uh, not only in terms of affordability, but also from the price point. So, so the initial idea was to start with Arabic content, tell stories from this part of the world, and really target the... Um, the millennial, uh, the millennial as well as the Gen Z, and because they weren't being served uh, by by the broadcasters at that time, and it just so happened that the way to serve that content or the way to serve that audience need was through streaming. So that's why tech for us was uh, perhaps step two. 
Um, so, and then along the way, we, we realized that, yes, we've managed to raise money, uh, you know, through friends and family and then institutional investors, but, but there's, uh, uh, there's just money and then there's smart money. And, and that's where we started to realize that we really needed uh, a local strategic partner. Um, one where, yes, we would have access to capital, but more importantly, also have access to strategic resources. So finding that perfect balance, uh, we, we used to joke about it and said, you know, we want a, a low carb paratha, you know, working, <laughs> working with a partner that, that serves both sides of the business. But, uh, but that's exactly what it ended up being for us in, in our Series C. We, we had uh, Etisalat, or E-and now, um, uh, come in and join the venture. Because what that did for us was completely changed our distribution and, and our reach in the region. Because E-and um, is, a lot of people know this already, but they're the world's seventh largest telecom group globally. So it gave us access to markets like Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Morocco. So, so for, for us, that partnership commercially was, was much more important than just, than just the capital. But if you can find that balance, uh, find a strategic partner that will still let you run the business uh, and let you be an independent company, build, build on your own ambition, but back that up with some strategic partnerships. Uh, that was really perhaps, if there was one secret to our success, it was probably finding that, that strategic mix of Lionsgate as well as uh, uh, Etisalat in scaling our business. So, um, SN, for, for, for Daraz, I mean, you have a South Asia platform now, right? Yeah. So, that was already, always, the, always that plan or... Something yeah, I think, uh, you, you know, initially it started with uh, really Pakistan and Bangladesh, very similar markets. Um, uh, you know, to, to, to some degree. And, and the acquisition of KMU in 2016 is what helped us sort of expand into, uh, into you know, Sri Lanka and Nepal. And Sri Lanka being, you know, very highly digitized market, so it's very different than, than Pakistan and even to a large degree Bangladesh. But what was interesting was that eventually this was very important in the acquisition by Alibaba. Because Alibaba's vision was to have 2 billion global consumers, and there isn't 2 billion people in, in China. So they really started you know, looking outside to see where can they find the, a large uh, you know, scale player that had uh, you know, at least to some degree dominance over a uh, you know, large number of consumers. And that's where we really fit in well. And I think that's where having Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Nepal, and Myanmar, collectively over half a billion people, um, really helped. And of course, it was not you know, the same um, income uh, levels as, as they had in China, but the bet was that in a longer term that these markets would be uh, an area where they could penetrate and get to their two billion mark. So it wasn't, um, you know, the idea of, uh, it was really just started with, for Pakistan and Bangladesh, um, you know, having the, the, mer the acquisition of KEMU evolve into more countries. I think it fortunately worked out that it was, you know, Alibaba was a player that needed to consolidate and, and uh, this was going to be a, a one way for them to be able to answer their two billion global consumer vision. Um, that eventually really fit, you know, nicely into that puzzle. Um, so I think it, it seems like there are different drivers here, right? So there, and it's all sizes don't, fit, you know, everything. You know, it, 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 not everything is fit for purpose for every industry and, and every part. Some of them are driving. Some, sometimes, sometimes your investor base is driving. Sometimes your fundraising needs are driving that expansion. Sometimes it's the scalability itself, right? And and in certain industries, you may not need to. And you know, as you're pointing out, certain aspects, maybe even fintech, it's a bit challenging with the government regulation. And maybe Michael and, and, and Noreen would have a better sense around the fintech universe around regulation as well. But um, it's interesting for me um, that even though you have expanded across all these regions, you have developed and kept your big uh, back-end tech development in, in Pakistan locally. Why, that, why was that a choice? And do you, what was the upside or downside of doing so? Any thoughts around that? Perhaps I have the mic, so I'll just start uh, rather than passing it around. Um, so for us, actually, our main tech hub, we have, we have multiple tech hubs now. And then after the acquisition by Alibaba, we've had to, uh, you know, we, we now have, our, our main tech hub is actually in China. But we have over 100 engineers that, that sit in Pakistan. 
But what for me is always uh, uplifting is that out of the five countries that we're in, all of our talent that serves the other countries is still in Pakistan. So of course we've created hubs in Singapore and China and you know, having Alibaba and obviously we need to have Chinese speaking uh, tech teams as well. So that's really pushed us towards that. But out of all the five countries, majority of the talent, if not all of it, actually still sits in Pakistan that caters to all of the countries. Um, so whereas before, obviously, it was you know only in Pakistan. After the acquisition, it has had to obviously evolve um, because a lot of the tech is you know the back end is is coming from Alibaba. You know, so I think um, the perspectives have changed a lot. Well, for us, you know, we were pre-COVID, um, and you know now there's conversations about remote teams uh, in different parts of the world. I think we. From day one, we were euphoric about the product um, and how it was going to meet customer needs. Um, having a team that we could you know, interact with, whether it was on the product side or the tech side, we had more control over administering that journey. Um, you know, maybe we were too young in our journey, uh, so it was tougher for us to understand how it worked managing remote teams. Um, but you know, when we started off, it was key to Launch t timing was you know of essence. Um, so we did go with um, a vent with, with a development company called Venture Dai, which Kareem also had engaged, um, and we worked very closely with them. They were solely working on you know developing our tech. Uh, but I think within Pakistan, we had the resources available on the tech, which was you know an easy bet for us to have bet on the on the tech teams within Pakistan. But you know as we grew, um, with particularly on the credit scoring side we did feel the need to look for resources outside of Pakistan because you know, there were some skill sets that were missing. Um, and I think COVID actually expedited that move. Um, you know, I think we, you know, it, it opens your mind to you know, doing things that otherwise you, you, you would have been myop yeah, myopic about. So when, that's when we you know, started um, onboarding our data science team outside of Pakistan. And that's when we went to China. Um, you know, DC, and that's how we, we started, you know, expanding the team. But yeah, the core team and the core product, you know, was in Pakistan, and even now with Zootpay, you know, we're, uh, while, you know, there are tech teams in different parts of the world, we are again focusing on, you know, expanding our tech in Pakistan. So, I think for us, um, two main drivers, one is, of course, cost, uh, it's a it's much lower cost than, than Dubai or many other parts of the world. So that was a natural place to start when we didn't have any money and the money had to go a very long way. But uh, but but Kareem, uh, Alhamdulillah, got very lucky at birth that uh, the circumstances around the starting of Kareem made it just very purposeful, right? And the purpose was around uplifting the region. And we did feel that there is a responsibility to build capability in the region, not just in Pakistan, but on other parts of the region as well. And uh, that sort of kept us in Pakistan, and not just kept us in Pakistan, but we have opened development centers now in Egypt, in Jordan, other places as well. And it was a bit uh, weird when we were not able to get some of the talent that we needed in these markets. We actually opened an office in Berlin, and a lot of people internally start questioning it. It's like, why are you opening an office in Berlin? Because <laughs> that sort of doesn't, is not included in the, in, in the remit. Um, and, and that's the sort of trade-off that we've had to uh, make. You know, you can be very purposeful, but you know, you have to find the right balance between purpose and what's good for business. And to some extent, we have stayed in Pakistan for the purpose, uh, even though I think realistically, the density of talent is, is, is a challenge, right? We were not able to find enough people in Pakistan or the capabilities in Pakistan, which is why we had to go to Berlin. We had to import a lot of people from the US and Europe into Dubai and hire a lot of people uh, in Dubai. Um, so it's been, it's been good, it's been purposeful, and we continue to invest, but we'd love to do a lot more. Uh, and, I, and I wish that uh, the, educational, uh, the education system, the higher education especially produces a much larger number of higher quality graduates. Um, people get a lot more experience building amazing products, scaling products, because that whole 360 hasn't happened, right? I think we're still uh, in an IT mindset to some extent, and we are still not, we've still not in many cases built products that have scaled a lot. 
So that depth of experience is currently missing. So inshallah, the teams that we have in other places are working closely with the teams in Pakistan and hopefully that learning is accelerated for the people that are working with us in Pakistan, inshallah. Yeah, so uh, completely agree with with Mudassar uh, on on aspects of uh, you know we haven't really built a product that scale at the global global level. Um, that's one area. I think I think the other area where um, we we've had to like Kareem and others here we've had to open up offices in in other parts of of the world. Um, so for example, in Madrid we we have a we have an office where we simply focus on design. And, and that's one of the areas that we couldn't find in Pakistan, that, uh, that sense of um, uh, mobile journey or mobile aesthetics in, in mobile apps, uh, th that was certainly missing. And I, and I feel that's part of the reason we had to go to Europe. Um, but I, I, but I, at, on the positive side, I think it's in the last seven or eight years since we've been there, the, 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 the scene has obviously changed a lot. I remember in 2014, uh, being from Pakistan, I was scared to mention to our uh, American shareholders that we want to open up an office, a uh, dev center in, in Pakistan. I was very cautious. So you do what a, a responsible CEO does, call each board member one by one. And, and luckily, uh, the first board member, American board member I spoke to, he lives in Denver, and I thought he was the one that was going to say no. Uh, but he jumped on it quickly, said, yeah, I'm on board of another company that that's developing apps in Denver, but they're doing all their development in, in Lahore, so it's a great idea. And, and that gave me some encouragement, because uh, you never want to have that stigma that he's from Pakistan, and that's why he's pushing that, that dev center, even though there's nothing wrong with it. Uh, but, and then, obviously, uh, Kareem had done that already with, with Venture Dive, and so, so we, we did a very responsible thing and opened up an office right next to theirs in, in Lahore and, uh, you know, and started recruiting. So uh, <laughs> we didn't hire any senior people, but it, your, your stock option plan was much better than ours, I think. Uh, so, but yeah, so Alhamdulillah, over the years, we've, we, have, we have 200 people there. Um, and, and, but we went with the idea of having our own office. Um, and I think... That's, that served us well because uh, I think Noreen was making a point about you want to be able to sit side by side between the product team, the design team, and, and you know, there's a lot of back and forth and refinement that goes. So, so we've, we've got, we went with the idea of having our own uh, uh, dev center, our own facility, and, and, and that's, that served us well. And now we're doing everything from, from back end to, um, to developing the apps, uh, to knock infrastructure. We do a lot of content work. So all of that is being done in Pakistan. The only part that we're not doing in Pakistan is, is perhaps the, the design of, of the, the apps. Um, I don't know what more I can add um, to everything that's already been shared, but. Uh, I th look, I think uh, just one point I would emphasize is that, you know, we roughly get about 40 million people on our platform every month. Um, and that kind of scale, um, uh, it's, it's, you know, it's people haven't seen that um, as, as, you know, people pointed out over here. So, so it's important. Uh, well, number one, um, look, I, I personally, myself, I come from a tech background in the U.S. I worked there for 15 years. Um, so it's a lot easier to do a uh, product uh, in Urdu. Um, uh, you know, I genuinely enjoyed it. Like you know, like so that was that was interesting. Um, but uh, we didn't have a choice. Uh, you know, with the amount of money we had, we started out of Pakistan. We had to build a tech center, and we kept investing in that uh, uh, from from day one. Um, the the only thing I would say is, and I completely agree with Mudassar over here, the system has to get better. The industry needs to play a bigger part. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't see companies that that. I mean, it's getting better, but need to be more involved with with the universities. Need proper career placement. Um, you know, and uh, I don't see the schools also having strong outreach to the companies. Um, so till we didn't go to the, to these universities, nobody reached out to us. Um, you know, and whereas if you look at the U.S., you know, there's a strong career placement. People are getting their students placed into good uh, good companies, and that's part of the reason why you actually end up in a lot of these schools. So, so that that whole ecosystem has to develop. The talent is great, uh, but we need to learn from you know 
not just draw a line from point A to point B. We need to learn how to traverse the whole, you know, journey. Um, and, and I think that talent, uh, it will take time. Um, and we need more local products. We need to support more local companies. Um, that's how it's going to evolve. Uh, but industry needs to play its part, and schools also need to get a bit more active. Uh, they, you know, uh, get more plugged in with the industry. Uh, uh, but it's it's great talent. It's great talent. I think uh, you know, and and we've had a lot of success. We, we uh, um, and and you know, and probably some of the challenges are solved. I'll just share this quick story with you. You know, like we back in the day, we were doing sales for Zameen. Um, our salespeople will go out and obviously you know, you're trying to sell a package to somebody to advertise on Zameen. And you, their manager would call them and they would say, where, where, are you, uh, you know, where are you right now? And it's like, oh, I'm with this client. Uh, it turns out he was watching a, a movie in a cinema uh, <laughs> or visiting his family in, in, you know, in the village, right? So we actually had to build tech to, to kind of you know, block this kind of behavior. Now, uh, I don't know where else in the world you would you would do that, uh, but uh, but that, that, that's you know there's there's a lot of interesting stuff that we have to build locally and that's uh, you know and we always build our software in house uh, so we had to have a lot of people uh, solving these kind of challenges. Okay. Akib, on your side, I think you've not only one but multiple uh, products you have developed locally, right? Um, Absolutely. I think uh, I I mentioned it to some extent. There is like the quantity of the people that pass out from universities here in Pakistan. It's like a lot of people, but the quality is, is a challenge. Mm -hmm. So for us, I think, as I mentioned, it was that university concept that we have in-house where we systematically build talent has been a savior. And that, that has been our unfair advantage. And this gives us like incredible, it gives us subsidy to the whole business. I mean, the way it works. So the, uh, we, we were benchmarking and the average cost that we would have incurred if we would have done that in US for per person, that we, the kind of talent that we have is $125,000 a year. Whereas we, we produce the same talent here for $18,000, $20,000. And they can compete. We have seen that. And from the same university, people have gone to AWS, Facebooks of the world and all. So I think it requires a patience. 5% uh, of our engineering team is outside Pakistan, the kind of talent that we don't find here. But we have been bringing people who have been there, done that in the valley. They come to Karachi. They do all the uh, counseling, coaching, uh, mentorship. They do trainings. And that's, that's our long-term plan to even uh, patch that 5% gap as well. The company that acquired us, the CEO of that company came to Pakistan. And uh, while he was leaving, he sent a note to his broader company and saying that my perception of Pakistan was far better than, uh, basically the reality was far better than the perception. Always when I come to Pakistan. And when I am in India or otherwise, my actual reality was inferior than the perception that I had. And, and the second thing he mentioned is that, I mean, the kind of hunger, ambition, and the work ethos that I'm seeing here, the kind of culture that you have built, uh, and the dedication and the commitment that they have is unseen. So it's not to be taken for granted. I think it's a job of our, our leaders to build that culture to build that environment where we have these kind of uh, people there. So I am pretty bullish on that. I think uh, there, is, there is a lot of talent on the middleware side, on the front end side, on the DevOps side. But to, for example, Norris point as well, I mean, there is some of the talent that's not available, but I think uh, a lot of companies are doing a great job, including Kareem and, and ourselves. And I see that in the, first, in the next few years or so, it will be uh, very benchmarkable when it comes to quality standpoint as well, yet at an amazing price. So. That, that's our unfair advantage. Sort of last question in a sense, um, and then I think we sort of open up to, to the crowd. Um, so with your exits, um, if you could maybe say one or two uh, things, I mean, did you specifically plan for it? Um, did it happen by accident? Um, anything specific uh, as an anecdote or challenge when you did go for your exit or your merger? Um, and what's life beyond the transaction? Because I see all of them are, of you are still there. So, <laughs> so for, for good or bad. So anything you would like to add on your side? Um, so uh, so for, for us, uh, we, we believe that we're in very early stages of, of this industry uh, evolution. So it was important for us that we 
we, we find the right strategic partner, find the right growth capital, but at the same time not give up um, everything in the business. So, so for us, the, the, we were able to convince our existing shareholders to bring in a new investor, but at the same time not sell uh, everything. So, so we, we opted for, uh, for, for a partial exit, if you will, where we sold 57% uh, of the business, but we retained the rest. Um, and, and the idea was that with this new strategic partner, we unlock more value and be part of that value creation. Of course, when you do something like that, th there's all these issues of protecting your exit rights and protecting your minority rights, but if, if that's taken care of, I, I think that's one of, the, uh, one of the routes I would recommend if you're in, in an industry where a lot more value is going to be created over the years. Yeah, look, I think uh, I had heard something somewhere at some point that uh, good companies are, are bought, right? They're not sold. Um, so I don't think anyone should have a mindset that they're building something to sell. Uh, because then you just make the wrong decisions, you build the wrong business, right? Your circumstances will be this or that or that. If you have the right foundations, then you can be around for any uh, situation that comes your way. In our case, uh, as I mentioned, uh, we got super lucky at birth. Purpose was the thing that uh, got Kareem started, that kept us going. And uh, when the first discussions with Uber happened, we literally looked at the purpose and said, this is what we've been telling ourselves and everyone else why we're doing Kareem. How far along are we on this purpose? And we said, simplify the lives of people. At that time, we had, I think, 5 million Maos. We were like 500 million li people live between Morocco and Pakistan. We're at 5 million, so there's at least 100x people that we still need to help in some shape or form. And then we said the second part of our purpose was to build an awesome organization that inspires because we felt that the region needed some self-belief and confidence. And somehow, because of the fact that Kareem became a unicorn, there was some inspiration created, but we felt it was still way lower than what the region could achieve. So we felt we still had to play a role to keep pushing the frontier of this. So we looked at our purpose and we were like, this is super, super early. And uh, hence, this is not the time to exit. What made it easier for us, similar to what Ma said, when we spoke to Dara and said, this is why we're doing it, he said, look, I don't want to change any of this stuff. I'm just going to replace your shareholders and become a better shareholder than them. Because I know how to build these type of businesses. And Alhamdulillah, that's what he has delivered. Uh, he has kept us independent. We're still working 15, 20 hours a day, hour days. They get all of the value. We get some stock options in Uber. That's fine. <laughs> But at this point, I think the, the objective is to, inshallah, build a Google or Amazon type of institution from this region that can be around for way longer than we remain on this planet. Um, so ENPG hasn't had an exit. Uh, you know, we did, uh, we did uh, a merger. Um, you know, we took over the uh, OLX assets. Uh, we took over Dibizal over here, OLX in Pakistan, Egypt, uh, a bunch of other places. Um, but uh, the, the way the deal was structured, I mean, we continue to be in control and we continue to run. Um, and we're not too hung up on, uh, on an exit. Uh, uh, you know, everybody's still having fun uh, doing what they're doing. I think that the thing that matters is how do you create liquidity for the people in the business? Uh, some of the people have been along for a long time, um, you know, eight, ten years. Uh, and uh, so that's, that's, why we even, that's why we even talk about it, think about it. Um, you know, we recently mentioned that we're going to be looking at an IPO, and, and the idea really is to create liquidity for the folks who've been in the business um, um, so that they can have a better payday. Um, but the journey continues, and, and it's a fascinating space, right? I mean, when you have users on your platform, you can, you can do some amazing things. Um, so your mind is always busy. Um, you know, I don't know what, uh, other than besides maybe playing video games, I don't know what I'll do, uh, mm -hmm. if, you know, or what we'll do <laughs> if we sit at home. So, so it's, it's a good journey and it's a different kind of problem, right? You're trying to solve the problem at scale. Um, so uh, just, yeah, just staying busy and uh, just staying focused on the business. Yeah, I think uh, we were building a long-term business and uh, it was never the idea to sell it. Uh, we were the customers of DigitalOcean, the biggest customer of DigitalOcean who acquired us. And for us, mission was important. So we were, if you talk to our best customers, they were like, we are literally building our dreams on top of your platform, right? And we found out that with partnership with DigitalOcean, I think we will be able to turbocharge 
our mission and we'll be able to do what we want to do in a much faster way, better way. And this is an amazing one plus one sort of 11 uh, opportunity. So I, I was about to raise my first kind of like funds. We had a term sheet at that time already. We were raising $80 million between primary and secondary. At that time, the CEO came and he offered that. And I thought that not just good for our people, uh, our customers, most importantly our mission, but also for our region as well, because it used to be a myth that great global companies cannot be built from Pakistan, right? And I, I thought that, I mean, that's a great opportunity to validate that, that we can build great B2B SaaS companies from Pakistan. And we took our decision with our founders. And uh, now I'm the chief revenue officer there, uh, the global level, taking care of the next, uh, finding next billion dollars in revenue. Thank you. I think uh, the initial discussion with Alibaba was actually, you know, more on the lines of finding some capital and finding a minority shareholder. And again, I think because it fit the, the puzzle so well, this eventually evolved into, you know, a long due diligence process and then, a, and then a transaction. And I think what's been actually very important for us is that we have remained very independent. And that doesn't always happen in all the Alibaba acquisitions. So in Pakistan, sorry, actually in all of Daraz, they're still, they're run by local uh, teams entirely. So people still get shocked when they come to our office and they say, we don't see any Chinese here. And you will not find any, you know, any Chinese in our offices. They're run entirely uh, independently. We, you know, we agree with them on certain topics every few months or annually, and then we, we go ahead and uh, chase that. And I think what's been very crucial for that, and similar to what Modesser mentioned as well, is really the purpose of the organization. And I think that's how we've been able to attract very good talent. And this element of uplifting communities through the power of commerce is really inbuilt in our in our DNA now, and I think that is something that we would not have been able to do had you know had it just been an Alibaba acquisition rebranding and you know their culture. We really had to maintain that local culture, um, that local touch and feel to your customer, and really understanding their pain points. And when you say you want to uplift them, it's very different uplifting someone in Pakistan and uplifting someone in China. And only we could really you know have a have a sense of that, and only we could really feel. Why, why we wanted to do that, and why we were willing to work you know, days and nights to, to achieve that purpose. And so I think it was also a very prudent uh, decision by, by Alibaba that uh, you know, in some markets they have, uh, uh, you know, for example, if they've acquired Lazada, they've, they've, they've put in place their teams. But in, in South Asia and in our markets, it was really making sure that the, independent, that the local teams were empowered and that we were able to build on the mission and purpose that allowed us to get there. And I think that, alhamdulillah, has been what has uh, allowed us to reach to, to the place we are today, and that sort of is what drives us uh, going forward. Maybe on your side, you need to explain the exit experience. Yeah, absolutely. You know, so I um, second a lot of things that you know, all of you have actually said, um, uh, especially to Mudassar, you know, I, I completely agree. Um, good companies are bought, not sold. Um, and you know, so it's, it's actually ironic <laughs> Prior to this exit conversation even happening, you know, I was actually hosting this workshop and I, I studied this Howard case study, ATH Technologies, which was actually about how a company started and how it got acquired and the entire journey post, you know, post the acquisition. Well, it didn't make sense to me at then, um, you know, at that time, but when this acquisition started happening, you know, a lot of you know the points from that case study started ringing bells, and I was like, "Hamza, you know, my co-founder, you have to read this case study." You know, um, interestingly, um, with Zood, well, for us, never. You know, exit, and you know, this might ring a lot of bells with the VCs here, and I don't know whether you know this is the right approach or not. We never had an exit strategy as founders, at least, you know, the people who started the company. Purpose was always at the center for us. Um, you know, we'd started a company prior to Thais, which also had the same purpose, which was, you know, the same as Thais. It was just another medium to reach that purpose. So when, uh, you know, I remember this boardroom conversation happening with one of our group, member, our group board members, Mr. Salim Raza, and, you know, someone asked um, us in front of him, you know, what's your exit strategy? You know, he got really upset. He's like, you know, the exit strategy is for the investors to think about, not for the founders to think about. The founders have to focus on the business itself. And you know, I completely agree with what he said, and you know, it, it now makes much more sense to us. Um, so when this, you know, this uh, conversation started, we had already started talking to Zood back in 2019 for a partnership. You know, and you know, at the time, we were growing. Um, 
And you know, there's this entrepreneur ego. I'm sure there's lots of it in this room. Um, you know, you, you aren't really thinking about partnering with a company who you think, you know, you can do, maybe you can grow faster than at the time, but you know, we, we, we see how far Zood had grown at the time. And fast forward, you know, COVID happened and fundraising, as we know, was already very tough. And for lending, which is again, a, a much more risky asset class, it was even tougher. Um, so I think the, the pieces of the puzzle started falling into place. Um, and with this acquisition, we had about two other offers on the table. Um, and you know, it was, we really literally had to orchestrate the deal. At least I had to orchestrate the deal because at the time I had to talk to, you know, our current investors. I had to talk to my, my co-founders also, you know, I had to orchestrate that deal with them. And of course, I think for us, the most important, it was, it was not very difficult to understand. It was the team. What was going to happen with the team after the acquisition? What, what was going to happen with the vision? Um, you know, Zood had actually, in other markets, started out with the concept of BNPL. And to be very honest, you know, with all due respect to all the BNPL out, players out there, it didn't really resonate with me as, you know, with the purpose that we set on for. But then, you know, I remember Michael came to Pakistan and, you know, he, he was talking to us about his vision. And that's when, you know, things started making sense in terms of what, you know, he was really wanting to do. So I think that vision alignment was the most important and, of course, how that team was going to get absorbed into the overall structure, that really made things easier for us to really make that decision to who to, who to go with. And yeah, um, you know, it just, it seemed like very serendipitous and now today fast forward, you know, this acquisition has happened. And I think culture has played a very important role. They say, you know, for most acquisitions, well, it's only been one for me. Um, it's really the culture that makes it or break, breaks it. It doesn't seem like, you know, that acquisition actually happened. It seems like, you know, we've literally, you know, parented a child to someone else who maybe can take better care of it. You know, so that's how it happened. That's, that's a good way to put it. Um, so I think that's where our, our Q&A sort of stops and I think we open to the crowd, but we'll have a sh short period for, for Q&A. So if you can keep your questions very short and sweet, uh, so others get some opportunity to also ask some questions. Um, I think one thing which comes out for me here is that the startup journey till a, a transaction or exit takes time. It's eight, eight, nine years, 10 years, sometimes more, 14, 15 years um, in some of the founders' journeys. Pakistan started getting VC capital two, three years ago, materially speaking. You should think about exits probably seven years down the road um, coming in. I think that's, that's my thing if I look at the experience of these founders here. Um, maybe let's open to the, to the crowd. Yeah. Hi. Uh, so I'd like to uh, direct a question to Akib. Uh, this is not, Cloudway is not your first global company, right? Yeah. Um, I meet a lot of founders in Pakistan. I rarely ever meet anyone trying to build a global business. Uh, and you guys have built two successful ones. Um, so what was the thinking like where you guys decided to go down that path and actually thought uh, a global business yeah. is possible before, before even the first one? So we were doing projects for different agencies and small businesses at that time. I mean, it was we were pretty pretty humble beginnings. Uh, in fact, myself was there and Omer. I think uh, was there and Omer. If you can please raise your hands here. I mean, the partner in crime. I think we we were doing projects, and uh, while doing those projects, we found that these agencies have these problems that if they want to manage this infrastructure and application themselves, it's going to cost them a lot of opex and learning curve. And we thought that okay, we can solve this problem for them uh, as a part of our proposition. But that agency business or one customer, one problem, one solution was never kind of like our uh, an ultimate goal. And it never kind of like fulfilling our passion to build uh, like a great generational platforms and products out of there. So we, we started offering that solution on a cloud management side, an application management site, one customer, one problem, one solution. But we, re we realized that, again, we ended up in a service business. But there was an opportunity there to convert that service business into a product business. And then after several pivots and several kind of like uh, failures, we came up with our own platform. Uh, I think uh, initially we were reselling somebody's platform to validate the idea. And myself and Omer, uh, back in the day, we were in Hong Kong and we got an email from the CEO of that platform that uh, I'm kind of like bankrupt and, and folding the company. Uh, you guys decide what you're gonna do. 
and the next flight we picked, we came to Karachi, and we were at the crossroads. Either we would have uh, closed the company, or we would have set up our own team and built that platform ourselves. We took that leap of faith, uh, trusted our team, we invested in the platform, and the rest is history. Hey guys, Brandon from Satapay. So um, now that you've gone through the experience, some of you uh, selling your company or working with someone who's buying your company, more importantly, um, what advice would you give maybe smaller startups who are looking at 2023 as an opportunity to maybe work with even smaller companies that are maybe struggling, might not be able to raise funding, and then you have smaller acquisitions? What are your learnings from your M&A transaction that you think would uh, be helpful to share with uh, maybe someone like Satape who's looking to absorb a much smaller company, um, if any. Yeah, I mean, maybe I can uh, I can just add to this, and I think part of it is where, of course, it was a bigger transaction, maybe the Alibaba Daraz one, but being, yeah, uh, just being organized, I think, really helped. Uh, making sure that you know the financials are organized, and a lot of time was wasted just because I think at that time we were not as organized. So I think, you know, where having a process defined where uh, where you're looking at, you know, these acquisitions in a way that it's systematic will just allow you to be able to do them uh, faster and be able to get to the, you know, the tougher parts, which is, you know, integrating the cultures and making sure that you can scale the businesses. That would be one thought. So, so Brandon, we did uh, quite a few of them uh, in the early days. Um, so the two or three things that, that really worked. Uh, number one, a lot of these companies are super early. You're basically getting talent on board more than any other thing. So you have to be able to want these people that are part of that company to come on board culturally, capability-wise. And that's the first thing that you got to do, make sure that these are the right people that you would love to work with. Second, uh, you know, we were very generous on uh, equity upside and also very generous in recognizing what they had done. So in many cases, those companies, if we had not made a move, they would have not survived. Uh, but in the way that we sort of conducted ourselves, we really gave them an exit when it came to publicity, recognition, what they had built, and made sure that they got equity in Kareem that was going to be meaningful and interesting for them to come in and work with us as partners to make this thing successful. So um, we did a few of them, and some of them were actually pivotal. And we acquired a delivery business in Saudi. We brought in a co-founder as through that acquisition that ended up uh, becoming quite transformational for us. Thanks. Uh, my name is Mehboob Mahmood. I'm uh, the founder of Knowledge Platform. We're a tech company. And I have a heart and mind question. You see, in Pakistan, there are 85 million kids, 22 million out of school. We have second largest school population. So from a heart perspective, I really want to provide education to everybody, you know? So I'm focusing on things like something that are not making me any money at all right now. Like, how do you educate an out-of-school kid? It's a really tough problem. On the other hand, now, mind, you know, internationalizing. So 40% of our revenue is now coming from overseas. But it's a continuous tension. How, do, how have you managed this tension? What implications does it have for fundraising? You know, should I only go to certain kinds of investors? How does one manage heart and mind? Let me, let me take a stab at this. I'll give others a chance to think. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a fantastic question. And, and, and just let's let's uh let's take an extreme because i think it'll probably clarify things right if you were just running a charity and if the heart was the only thing that was at play then you'd run out of funds very quickly because the problem that you're describing requires tens of billions of dollars to fix and we don't have tens of billions of dollars in this room uh to to go after that problem so you cannot run purely with heart so you need to find the balance between heart and mind, which is the question. And I'll tell you one or two things that we do, and maybe hopefully that helps. So one, we find ourselves at an interesting intersection between the Gulf and the frontier markets like Pakistan and Egypt. And mental model is that 
we'll build a exciting business in the Gulf that's going to be making money, so the money can then be invested in the other markets. Now, at times, that means that we have to focus a lot more on the Gulf to make sure that we can solidify our position. But that sort of focus comes at the expense of investing in those markets. And that's the collateral damage that we have to accept to be able to have the foundation that's going to allow us to sustainably serve those markets in the long term. So it pains me when I meet a lot of you and saying Kareem service in Pakistan is not as good as it used to be. It hurts me. But to me, this is collateral damage at the moment. If I want Kareem to survive and be around for 20, 30 years, 40 years from now to deploy billions of dollars in Pakistan, then first we need to make those billions of dollars that will go into Pakistan in the long term. But that's maybe one way to think of this. The second thing that I heard, which I thought was, was, was exceptional, there was an interview with uh, Melinda Gates that someone did, and they, it was a philanthropic event, and someone asked her, hey, what is one advice that you would give me? And she said the one advice would be, run a philanthropy like a business, and you'll do well. So I think we have to bring a lot of the best practices in building, scaling businesses into philanthropy as well. Now, of course, make sure that the right culture, the right purpose is in place to make sure that when you start making money, that money gets deployed in the right places. Otherwise, uh, those will get returned to shareholders, and the right purpose will not get achieved over time. I don't know if that's helpful. I mean, it's a genuinely tough question because, you know, when you go to raise money, um, you know, some, some people have a seven-year window, ten-year window. Um, the only thing that I've seen is that, again, with some of the family offices, uh, they are actually into more social uplift uh, across the world, uh, right? And, and they'll, they'll actually earmark some money for that. So if you can find a match like that... Um, there, there are, a f but far and few in between, right? Because typically when you show up in an institutional investor, you know, it's a fun seven-year life, ten-year life. Uh, numbers do matter. Uh, returns matter. Uh, they're trying to do better than the regular stock market. Uh, so um, so I think that's, that's one area where you can look at. Um, and uh, that's something that we also learned along the way, uh, that they actually had invested in certain countries for social uplift. Uh, um, uh, so I think that that is one thing, but gen genuinely a very difficult, uh, very difficult proposition, right? Uh, y even if you, um, y you know, you have to have some story. I feel at, at the end, like five years out or ten years out, it has to make some money um, if you're going to go raise money on that. Uh, otherwise, it's just you know, it's it's somebody's goodwill. Uh, that's what I feel. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. I think we're sort of uh, out of time. Uh, so I'm sure there are lots of more questions, but apologies. Um, we have to move forward. Uh, fantastic panel. Thank you very much. Amazing to have you guys here.